Good morning, Gateway Bible Church. Please turn in your scriptures to the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 1. That all too familiar chapter we are privileged to be able to dive into this morning as we continue in our sermon series, Mission Possible. And I would just ask for you to bow your heads with me in humble reverence to our Heavenly Father who permits us to hear this message and to sing his praises this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, we just thank you no matter where we are, if we are uh, being part of this service online or if we are here in the sanctuary, if we are miles away or if we are on a mountaintop or if we are in the deepest blue sea, Father, we know that you are there. We believe in the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, and how it reconciled us to you. And Father, we believe that on this wonderful day, you gave your Holy Spirit to the body of Christ, to his body, the church, on this wonderful day that we uh, study now in Scripture. Father, we need your Holy Spirit, especially to show us the way in these next uh, 12 verses, 13 verses. Lord, we surrender ourselves to you and ask that you would fill us as we do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I need to tell you, for those of you who might not know or not, might not have been familiar with Acts chapter 1, that the sight of Jesus Christ ascending into heaven would have been a remarkable one if you remember the story. It was an extraordinary sight, but there was something even more extraordinary. And that was the look on the apostles' faces. If you could imagine it. Finally, the, the, the scriptures declare in Acts chapter uh, 1, verse 10, it says, Luke uh, says, he writes that they steadfastly looked uh, toward the heaven as he went up. And they are sort of in awe. They are amazed. They're dumbfounded. And then what happens? Two angels came come by while their heads are looking up and, and Jesus is becoming ever smaller in that cloud, in that luminous cloud. And, and he's going up into heaven, much like you might even look at a, at a rocket ship descending out of the Earth's atmosphere. And then two angels, while they're still looking up, come and say, hey, why are you looking up like that? Get busy. He's coming back in the same manner. You have work to do. So their eyes are filled with awe and wonder. And that's the way it is for the next 10 days. Jesus had been with them after his resurrection for 40 days. Now, remember this. Jesus promised them that he uh, was going to fill them, fill them, F-I-L-L, -L, fill them with power uh, in a little while. If they did one thing, what was that one thing? They must wait in Jerusalem for this filling. They really did believe that Christ was going to send the Holy Spirit. We looked at that last week. There was no doubt. There was no waffling. But now they are more aware than ever of the necessity of the master's presence. After all, while Christ was here on earth during those 40 days, what did he do? He was still with them. He met with them and he ate with them and he talked with them and he walked with them in his resurrected body for 40 days. Even during those 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension, he was blessing those uh, disciples with his presence. But now he is gone. No more visits, no more talking with him, no more eating with him, no more visiting with him, no more meals, no more being taught. And it is in this 10 day period between uh, the ascension that they just witnessed and the Pentecost and Pentecost that's coming that these disciples become increasingly aware of their need. And remember, that is the theme as we go through these next 12 verses. This 
my friends, if you can discover it and appropriate it for yourself. Being aware of your need. You understand this chapter of the book of Acts. What need, by the way? Their need to be filled. To be filled. Why? Because I got to tell you that those disciples, with the loss of their master, now undoubtedly they feel empty. Amen? They feel empty. They remembered. I promise you, and you will remember it too, as you leave this place this morning, they remembered the words of the master where he said in the book of John, chapter 15, verse 5, without me, you can do nothing. Ouch. And now the master is without me. Now he's gone. And they would have understood exactly that emptiness. It is that profound emptiness that is embedded in their consciousness that precisely makes them ready for Pentecost. For the filling. What happens? What happens to the apostles when the Spirit comes at Pentecost? What happens when the Holy Spirit personally fills us, by the way. Well, the answer comes in verse 1 of chapter 2 of the book of Acts, where it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were there, uh, they were all with one accord in one Place. By the way, that place is still the upper room, but we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But for now, what's happened? The day of Pentecost has arised. It has been um, uh, 50 days since Passover. 50 days since Christ was crucified as the Lamb of God. After all, Pentecost literally means the 50th. That's what it means. It was literally a week of weeks after Passover. A week of weeks. What's that? Seven times seven is 49. And that becomes important. It's a, it's a feast of weeks. Originally, if you go all the way back, and we're going to go there in just a little bit, if you go all the way back, you will find that it was called the Feast of first fruits. And if you remember there in Leviticus chapter 23, that's where the priest gathered. Uh, he made two loaves of bread and he waved them around and it was gathered from, uh, it, was, it was made from uh, freshly gathered grain. It was very precise. The feast of first fruits was. Amazingly, Pentecost as it turns out, is the most appropriate day for the giving of the Holy uh, Spirit and the conversion of what we will witness next week of those 3,000 souls, because, my friends, those 3,000 souls become a sort of first fruits, do they not? We're here. They are the first fruits, but we are here. We're fruit, and we have been added to them. Now, the Feast of First Fruits, uh, that's not easy to say for some reason, First Fruits, uh, took place on the day after the Sabbath following the Passover. Now, this becomes important. The day after the Sabbath. The uh, meaning that it always occurred on the first day of the week. Now, for those of you who may not be acquainted with the Jewish uh, day uh, calendar and the ways of reckoning time, um, the, the Sabbath is the what day? It is the seventh day. And uh, we call that Saturday. And uh, the next day after that is Sunday. The first day of the week is Sunday. Uh, that's important. Why? Because it is on that day that our Lord and Savior rose from the dead. Amen. And when he did that, he also, keep this in mind, became the first fruits the Bible declares, of those who sleep, of those who died. Look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. 
He says, now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. My friends, this is why we worship. This is why we assemble on Sunday. It has been that way for a long time. Time, the first day of the week, because that is the day our Lord rose from the dead. Now, I just want to remind you, if Pentecost was 50 days later, seven weeks plus one day, it's the day after of the Sabbath, then Pentecost, my friends, also obviously occurred when? On the first day of the week. So not only did Christ rise on the first day of the uh, week, but the Holy Spirit is given to the church on the first day of the week. That is also why we assemble and why we are here this morning. Now there is no doubt that Pentecost occurs by divine arrangement. You will see that thread as we move forward. What happens on that special day? What happens to the apostles at Pentecost? Verse 2, where it says, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. First, there is wind. And a mighty wind it is, as those apostles are most likely bowed in prayer in that upper room. What happens? A breeze begins to uh, move across them. Now, I need to tell you, wasn't a little a little breeze like that. It was a mighty breeze. It's, it's much more than a breeze. Literally, it's an echoing sound as of a mighty violent wind. Oh, it roars through the house. It would have sounded like a tornado. And you could just imagine their robes would have been flapping with that wind. The Spirit of God is coming upon them. Now, Here's just a, a little technical information. The same uh, word, the, the word in, uh, in Hebrew for wind is the word ruach. And in Greek, that word is pneuma. We get our, you know, we get words like our pneumatic tires from it. You know, something that has air in it. They're both the same and they're used uh, the same. That is used for the Holy Spirit. And Ruach in the Old Testament, a pneuma in the new. So in the Old Testament, this idea of the Holy Spirit wind coming on something is not unique. You will find it. For example, Ezekiel uses Ruach to describe the Spirit of God moving over that valley of dry bones, that spiritually dead nation there in Ezekiel 37, verse 9. This is what God says, Come from the four winds, O breath. And breathe on these slain that they may live. So what's happening here? The winds of God, the winds of the Holy Spirit come upon the apostles. And they bring incredible spiritual life. They now have God's uh, life-giving spirit more than they have ever had before, more than they've ever seen before. It's unpre unprecedented. It's more than they have ever kn known. So first there's wind, and then comes fire. Fire in verse 3. Then, it says, there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. Starting to get that flavor of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And after all, if you remember back in the book of Luke, back in the, in the early days, back in Matthew where uh, John was baptizing, this is what it says. This is what John said in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. He says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And now it is here. There is this fiery presence of God in their midst. 
and it suddenly divides into these separate individual flame-looking things on each uh, of the apostles' heads. I want to remind you that fire has always indicated the presence of God, especially in the Old Testament. I would ask you now just to conjure up in your minds how many times the Lord interfaced with his people through fire. It happens all the way back in the book of, a book of Exodus. The first sign is the what? The, the burning bush with Moses. And then there's the fire that's continually in the, on Mount Sinai. And if you remember, as the Israelites, those ancient Israelites, traveled through the desert, what happened? That pillar of fire went before them. Remember that. Wow. But there's something obviously new here, isn't there? There's a new significance because that fire comes and it divides. And what does it do? It starts dancing over the apostles individually, individually on their heads. And, this, and it's telling us that the Spirit of God rests upon the believer individually. That's what's happening. The emphasis from Pentecost onward is the personal relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. What else happens, Pastor Wayne? First there is wind. Then there is fire. Then there is divine utterance. And it happens in verse 4. Verse 4 says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is electrifying. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, the Scriptures declare, and they begin to speak in other languages. Before we go on, I want to tell you this. Those are other known languages. Languages that existed on the surface of the planet at the time of Pentecost. But they spoke in these languages, and I need to tell you, they spoke as clearly and as powerfully as those Old Testament prophets would have done. And to us, this event may seem a little esoteric, a little mysterious, but not to those first century uh, Jewish observers. Yes, it has that sort of primal ring to it. Earth, wind, fire. No, there's no earth. I'm thinking about a funk band from the 70s. Wind, fire, water. It's very, it has that really mysterious primal ring. But the, the, those people that would have been observing it or even experiencing it would have known exactly what that meant because in the Old Testament as well, inspired speech like this is not uncommon. You would have seen it. I don't want to list all of the times that that happened. But Pentecost is an obvious day for such speech. To the observant Jew, they would have known it was a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And so when God visits his people, he brings this wind, this fire, and this divine utterance. Now, could you imagine being in that room, being in there with those apostles and those disciples? How did they feel when the heavens opened up and began to roar and that mighty wind blew and this fire uh, came over them? Uh, by the way, a sound that was so loud that it attracted people from all over Jerusalem. That's how loud this fire was. How did they feel? I want to tell you that that burning expectancy that they had, that, that emptiness, that desire to be filled, was suddenly filled in an instant. What does verse 4 say? And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And so the question we need to ask is, what does this mean? What does this mean in their relationship to God? In their relations to other uh, apostles as well as other believers? I want to take us away from this text. I don't do this very often. 
I like to teach the text that's before us. But I want, I want to do it because if we can go and look at some other places in the first century church, the very early church where this Holy Spirit was doing the work of filling the believers, we will learn a lot and we will understand not only what they were going through, not only what we can expect to go through, but what uh, the, the uh, Lord wants us to experience. Now, it comes from Ephesians 5, 18. By the way, there's other places. I'm just taking a very famous one where Paul speaks about this same phenomena happening in Ephesians chapter 5, verse uh, 18. There it says, Paul says, Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Sound familiar? Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for the things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. We see here that with this filling, there are four manifestations of the Spirit. There are four works that the Holy Spirit does through His believers with this filling. And by the way, you can see it in several other places. Here's the first one, and we're going to stick here in Ephesians in these, in these three verses, four verses in Ephesians. Here's the first one. When, the, when you're filled with, this, uh, with, your, with the Holy Spirit, there comes this new kind of communication. You will see it on the day of Pentecost, and you see it here in, in Ephesians chapter um, 5. What does it say? What does Paul say here? They begin speaking to one another. They're speaking to one another. What is that if that is not communication? This is not an old kind of communication pre-Holy Spirit. This is a new kind of communication. How did they communicate with each other? They communicated with each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Psalms, they used scripture. They were reading the scriptures, they were teaching the scriptures, and they were worshiping God by, uh, uh, through uh, singing and, and music. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? Now you can see this kind of communication phenomenon played out in your own life, I hope. I've certainly counseled enough of you in marriages. I see it in, in my own marriage. I can see it in my relationship with my wife. When, the, when we are both filled with the Holy Spirit, our communication intensifies and it glories God and it becomes very easy. There's a wonderful communication. We would have fit right in with those early disciples. There's communication. What else is there? In Paul's example of being filled that he gives us. Notice, there's joyful singing. What does Paul say? Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Sound familiar? I love the simplicity of this. There's joyful singing. What were they singing? What does it say? Hymns and spiritual songs. That's what they were singing. Sound familiar? That's what we do. Now, I need to tell you, first of all, if you've never taken the history of Western music at your local college or the history of ancient music, uh, can I it, we like to romanticize what that would have sounded like in the first century. No, it sounded radically. You would have thought it would sound horrible. That's just the way it is. We don't have our, our modern scales invented yet. It takes 1,500 years for that to happen. Where we, you know, when we sing, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do. Uh, no, none of that. This is what? Cacophony. Do you, are you going to force me? Does anybody else want to do it? You know, that, that kind of stuff. You can experience that in some, in some cultures today. There's nothing wrong with it. It just doesn't sound like what we have today. It would have been loud. And everybody would have been doing it. Nobody would have been saying, well, Pastor Wayne, I don't like to sing. 
I'm not a good singer, therefore I remain silent. Doesn't work. It doesn't work. Why? What does Paul say? He says, singing and making melody in your heart. And you say, oh, Pastor Wayne, see, I don't have to open up my mouth. It's, it's, it's happening deep inside. No, that's not what it means. It means because that's in your heart, it just outflows. It doesn't matter what it sounds like. They're singing hymns and spiritual songs. The inner music of their soul, is, it doesn't stay inside here, does it? It goes out and it goes up to God. That is ultimately what they're doing. We would have fit right in with those disciples. Amen. What else is there in Paul's example? There's Thanksgiving. Luke says in Acts chapter 2, which we're studying now on Pentecost, they were telling in their own tongues the mighty words of God. Paul says they are giving thanks always for all things. That's what we do. We add that in. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. This is a natural response. We would have fit right in with those disciples. Such action, by the way, is supernatural, because if you look at this fourth thing in the, in the last bit, uh, what does it say? They were submitting to one another. They were submitting to one another in the fear of God. My friends, I need to tell you something very obvious. If you spent any time with us in the book of Luke, this will be patently obvious to you. This is not natural. This is supernatural. These believers, these apostles, these early disciples, they were not like that before the what? The filling of the Holy Spirit. They were not like that. What do you remember about those guys? Aren't, weren't those, were they in submission to one another? No, it's not what I remember. I remember them squabbling, fighting over who was going to get the best seat in the kingdom. I remember them fighting and squabbling who could sit next to the master. I remember them fighting and squabbling about washing each other's feet, that kind of stuff. And now, because of the Holy Spirit, they know how to submit. What a transformation. In all of the emotion and all of the ecstasy on Pentecost, this is what is actually happening deep, happening deep down in their souls. Amen? Now, this event that happened is so loud and so uh, heard that the People in Jerusalem are naturally going to respond. It happens in verse 5. In verse 5, it says, and there we're dwelling it. We're back in Acts chapter 1, verse 5. Acts chapter 2, verse 5, pardon me, where it says, and there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together. And we're confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. And then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all those who speak Galilee, Galileans? That's the crowd's response. That rushing tornado wind up there in the upper room brought this crowd from out all the corners of Jerusalem. And what happens? The apostles emerge and they start proclaiming the gospel in tongues, which means that those, uh, they're speaking in languages that they had no idea how to speak. They're speaking it they can't understand, but everybody that's hearing them can understand. And their hearers were amazed. Why? Because it says, uh, aren't these People speaking these languages, Galileans, don't lose that. Aren't these guys, it says they're all amazed, aren't these guys from Galilee? This, this isn't right. These people are ignorant. These people are uh, despised. They're country bumpkins, remember? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? These are the people who couldn't pronounce uh, uh, certain uh, Hebrew syllables correctly. 
But suddenly, these guys have ma uh, amazing linguistic powers. That's what's going on to this crowd that is comprised of people from all over the world. Look at what happens in verse 8. In verse 8, they continue. And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful words of God. That is amazing. That is a sign from God. This tongue speaking that happens on the day of Pentecost is obviously a powerful, powerful sign. Now, Luke names 15 geographical locations of which we are not going to go uh, through them all. That's not the point. The point is, what are they doing? These people, these citizens from all over the empire, from all over the known world, they clearly hear the disciples in their own language and they understand. They, what are they doing? They're, the scripture declares they're declaring God's wonderful works in intelligible words. This is not gibberish. One person starts speaking in perfect Latin and another one in perfect Phrygian, and on it goes. But no matter what the dialect he's using, each of the 12 hold forth and proclaim the wonderful works of God. It's a sign. Something new and magnificent is happening here. By the way, why does God do this? Why does he have them speaking in these known tongues? I want to tell you that God does it. He wants to make sure that everybody around the world knew that the gospel was for the entire world. Amen? Amen. The gospel is for the entire world. Those people are going to hear. And 3,000 in one day of these people from all over the known world are going to be saved. And those 3,000 who get saved, guess what they're going to do after the Feast of Pentecost ends? They're going back to Pamphylia. Those Cretans are going back to Crete. The Romans are going back to Rome, etc., etc. And you know what they're going to do? They are going to begin their portion of divine utterance and share the good news of Jesus Christ in their languages with the people that are in those places. God does want us to speak to every person in his or her own language and give the good news of salvation of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to be a little wonky here and point out a very obvious biblical contrast. I was... Uh, debating rather um, stringently this morning of even putting this in here, but I threw it in here anyway because, you know, sometimes I get fascinated. This might be my new show, it might not be, but I want to point something out here. There's a wonderful biblical contrast. There's a contrast here from what happens on the day of uh, Pentecost and the day that the Tower of Babel is erected. You remember that? It is a complete reversal of the judgment of the Tower of Babel, which the whole point of that tower was for what? For men to exalt themselves. That's the whole power. So what goes on? What happened to them, by the way, at the Tower of Babel, you remember? God confuses their languages. They can't understand each other anymore. God's judgment at Babel scattered the people. God's blessing at Pentecost unites the believers in the Holy Spirit. At Babel, people could not understand each other. At Pentecost, men hear praises of God in their own language. At Babel, the whole scheme was designed so that men could exalt and praise themselves. At Pentecost, the whole scheme is designed so that God can receive praise. Babel was an act of rebellion. Pentecost is about the humble submission 
to God. Amen? Amen? What a contrast that is. Verse 12, continue with this crowd's response. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to, no, uh, to one another, whatever could this mean? But others mocking said, they are full of new wine. Our modern colloquialism, they're drunk. They're drunk. All are amazed. There's no doubt about it. You're not going to be unfazed by what has just occurred. But not all receive it in the way they're supposed to receive it. Some are mocking. All are amazed and perplexed, saying, what does this mean? What, uh, whatever could this mean? But some are mocking. Of course there are mockers. These are the people who commit the fatal error of thinking that this is all natural. That this is all man-made. That, that what is occurring is not supernatural. They commit that fatal error. These are modern men. They're tuned out spiritually, flippant, self-reliant, making light of the important things in life. Do you know any people like that, my friends? I would think of the some people that might even respond to that way that as we uh, hear uh, our meeting on this day. But notice, others are amazed and they are sincere and they sincerely want to know what's going on. What do they shout? Whatever could this mean? Well, let me tell you. It means that the Holy Spirit brings new life to those who believe in Jesus Christ. Amen. It is a new life. And with that life comes power. And it means fire. It means fire in our lives. The fire that burns away the chaff that Jesus wants us to have burnt away. It means that the truth of God is now coming forth from us. Divine utterance in a way that it could never have happened before. And it means communication and joy and thankfulness and submission. Of course, it means all of that. But the question becomes, what does this require of us? Pastor Wayne, what does this require of us? Is this just an, a story that's been encapsulated in Scripture 2,000 years ago? We can read it and be somewhat uh, objective, removed. No. It requires from us the same thing that it requires from the first century believers, the people there at Pentecost. It requires emptiness. It requires emptiness. That emptiness is simply saying we acknowledge that we need Jesus Christ. Amen. And we need his Holy Spirit. We need that spirit that was promised to us for power, the power of witnessing, the power of serving, the power of loving, the unlovable. How many of you since this pandemic has occurred or we've been stricken through it since March 13th it is? How many of you have run across an ever-increasing amount of people who seem to be ever-increasingly unlovable? And by the way, I want to just point out something. This, this has to do with the difference between the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit. I want you to know that we are not commanded to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. That is something that God does in us once and for all when. When. When we place our trust in His Son, Jesus Christ, once and for all. And, and, and that's important. But we are commanded throughout Scripture to be what? To be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that is radically different. And you might say, well, Pastor Wayne, what difference does it make? 
Aren't you just mincing words here? The, uh, the, the important thing is that we have the experience. What does it, what does it matter? Well, my friends, I, I doubt that you would take that same approach in other areas of your life, more mundane than this. I doubt that you would take that approach in your cooking. Oh, it doesn't matter if it's cinnamon or if it's nutmeg. I don't know, I'm making stuff up. I, I never cooked anything in my life. Would that matter? How about auto mechanics? Uh, we'll put a 6-volt battery in there instead of a 12-volt battery. What's the big deal? Don't I sound like I know what I'm talking about when it comes to, to that? No, didn't do it for you. Medicine. Same thing in medicine. You know, there's the dip. We wouldn't take that stance in other more mundane areas of our life. The Holy Spirit has revealed God's truth to us in words. And each of these words is important in God's plan of salvation. Why? Let me tell you the difference between baptism and filling. Baptism versus filling. Baptism of the Spirit means that I belong now to His body. Amen? And I cannot get removed from that body. That's what happens with the sealing and the baptism when we believe in Jesus Christ. But the filling of the Spirit means that my body, my very being, all that I am, belongs to Him. That's the difference. Baptism is final. Filling is repeated. As we empty ourselves, as we trust in God for His power. Baptism be uh, involves all other believers. It makes us one in the body of Christ. Filling is personal and it is individual. And once we become Christians, the Holy Spirit works in us. It begins to work. And you know what the biggest work of the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the individual is? Are you ready? It's to liberate us from the thought that we can do Christianity, we can be Christians on our own. Each time we acknowledge our inadequacy, what happens? He fills us with more of His Spirit so that we can carry on His work. And my friends, we need it now more than ever. We need that Holy Spirit filling more than ever, and it happens when we declare our inadequacy. It requires humility. It requires confession. It requires us to be radically acquainted with those first century believers. The, they were living in that complete and utter dependency uh, until that filling uh, came. Now, here's the paradox. The key to the spirit-filled Christian life is a paradox. We must cultivate a knowing attitude of emptiness so that the Holy Spirit will perpetually fill us. And by the way, Jesus said it like this. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. What did he say? Read it with me. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Amen? Close your scriptures with me.